Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Fan Kaufman. And for uh, longtime listeners of the uh, Narrative Lectionary podcast, you've just recognized a new voice. Uh, Christopher Fan Kaufman, who is a new uh, faculty member in New Testament at Luther Seminary. Christopher, introduce yourself. No, what are What's the most embarrassing thing about yourself that you've never told anybody else? Mm, that's a good one. It's a not common knowledge, but I was uh, quite involved in the modern dance department at St. Olaf when I was an undergrad. So that's something that we can bring together into our my experience as a seminary professor. I don't know if that's embarrassing so much as a unknown fact. Oh, it's not, that's not embarrassing. Although I will say we don't do David dancing before the arc this fall. in mm. there. That, I think that was last year. Yeah. You don't think it's embarrassing because you've never seen me dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, what else? So you just said you went to St. Olaf College? Yep. I went to St. Olaf College for my undergraduate. I'm actually originally from California, so I'm still getting used to the Midwest life, though I've been here 10 years now. Did my MDiv at Luther and then actually did my doctorate at the University of Minnesota. I was the first graduate of their Religions and Antiquity program. And so I studied uh, specifically Matthew and Mark and the parables uh, therein and looked at agriculture and the way that ancient agriculture influenced the images that Jesus borrows for the parables. So I'm excited that we're talking about Matthew today. That's going to help us a lot um, in the spring when we do the year of Matthew uh, with all the parables of growth. Mm -hmm. We should uh, we should also mention uh, we'll we'll say this in our next podcast too. But just uh, for longtime listeners, um, Craig Kester is healthy and fine. He just uh, retired from Luther Seminary and decided to concentrate on his. Uh, epic commentary on the on the gospel of john so uh we miss craig uh we wish him well uh but and we welcome christopher uh and you'll hear other voices on this podcast as well but thank you so much for being with us christopher and offering your expertise and your theological insights to uh to this narrative lectionary podcast glad to be here thank you all right. Well, um, let's. Uh, so this is the podcast, which is the overview for uh, this year, 2022-2023, which is the year of Matthew. It's our, our gospel this year is Matthew. And um, there are the texts for the Old Testament are often chosen because of their resonance with Matthew, um, specifically um, the, the genealogy, especially in Matthew, which we actually read and preach on. Uh, harkens back, especially the, there's connections with Abraham and David there. Um, there's uh, We have the Ten Commandments this fall, and then there's the resonances there with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and Christopher, you were, uh, we don't necessarily um, read all of the fulfillment um, sort of formulas. This happened in order to fulfill, but um, why do you think it is that Matthew starts off with such an all of those fulfillment formulas? Yeah, one thing you often hear about the Gospel of Matthew, and I think we'll talk more about this in December, is it's often called the most Jewish of the Gospels. And I think that in some ways, this is a little bit of a, not misnomer, but a little bit unspecific, in that it's not the most Jewish of the Gospels because it highlights say, Jewish holidays and festivals. The Gospel of John highlights those festivals much more than Matthew does. Uh, the Gospel of Luke follows sort of an Old Testament arc, perhaps more than Matthew does. But Matthew is the Gospel that really reinforces over and over again the connection of the story of Jesus to the Old Testament. The most notable way, as you said, Ralph, are these, uh, this happened in order to fulfill and so we get several different, especially right at the beginning of Matthew, they're clustered, where uh, Matthew will present an episode in the life of Jesus, and at the end will summarize it by pointing to the way in which this episode fulfills a prophecy from the Old Testament. Uh, some of these are, for example, when the Holy Family flees to Egypt, we get the uh, the prophetic resonance with, out of Egypt I have called my son, uh, the slaughter of the holy innocents, 
uh, which we traditionally read on December 26th. This is resonant with uh, weeping in Rama from Jeremiah. And so over and over again, as I said, especially at the beginning of his narrative, Matthew wants us to know that this is uh, not a new story, but is deeply connected to the Hebrew scriptures that have come before. Which is particularly uh, appropriate for the narrative lectionary mm -hmm. as, we, uh, as we, our aim is to show that overarching story in scripture from Old to New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, as Craig uh, named his uh, his class. So, uh, so we're happy to have uh, to have you here, Christopher. And and as you said, we'll be talking more about Matthew uh, and its themes, uh, doing more of a, a, a an intro to Matthew uh, later this year in December. But uh, let's talk about some of these Old Testament texts that that are part of our narrative lectionary readings. Uh, for this year, uh, we start with um, uh, the the flood uh, and promise Noah's ark, uh, and go to the call of Abraham and 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 so forth. This follows the pattern that we've established in other years, of course, to do a reading first from the uh, what's called the primeval history, Genesis one through eleven, and then moving to Abraham, and then on to Jacob and Joseph. Though this year we mm -hmm. don't have a, a story about Jacob, uh, and then on to Exodus, but. Uh, we've uh, heard from listeners that they often uh, find it helpful to kind of subdivide these texts into smaller units uh, to think about perhaps a smaller preaching series that they might consider. Uh, so we're going to offer uh, one or two, but uh, obviously you're welcome to do those kinds of um, titling and the, the, those kinds of uh, divisions as you uh, see fit for the stories. So we're suggesting that perhaps uh, you might talk about covenant first or do a preaching series on covenant, uh, which really goes through uh, from September 11th through October 16th. So from the 14th Sunday after Pentecost to the 19th Sunday, the first six uh, readings here, because they talk uh, about various uh, covenants uh, and sometimes uh, the same covenant. And then uh, in the next grouping, we thought perhaps from October 23rd uh, through the, the Christ the King Sunday through November 20th, you could say something like living out the covenant or the covenant people or something like that. Because of course here we, uh, we have stories like David and Bathsheba, uh, Solomon, uh, the healing of Naaman by Elisha uh, and then some prophetic texts. So how do you, uh, live out the covenant. How do the people of God live out the covenant that God makes with uh, with God's people? Um, and then we can move into Advent as well. But let's let's stick maybe with that theme of covenant first. Uh, what do we want to say about that? Well, you know, um, first of all, just it, it's customary um, for people to talk uh, Old Testament um, interpreters often talk about the four major covenants of the Old Testament. There are more. But the four major ones being Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David, or so, and we actually get then, we're going to get um, really three of those in the sense, because we've got the flood story first, the, no, the covenant. And um, so I think one thing that's helpful um, is that at least for the first three, so it really kind of works, um, there's, uh, you have covenant partners, God and the ones with whom God is covenanting. And then there's a promise and a sign. And so, you know, th those to emphasize those elements and obviously the sign, the signs of the covenants are with um, the rainbow, the male circumcision. And then this, this is not widely known in uh, the, the Sinai covenant, uh, which is the other name for it, is the, um, the sign of the covenant is the Sabbath. Yeah, that's uh, that's helpful. So covenant, it's, it's not a word we use very often, uh, except in church circles. Um, a lot of uh, biblical uh, Hebrew Bible scholars talk about the um, similarity of the covenants in the in the Old Testament, particularly the Sinai covenant with uh, what are called suzerainty treaties uh, in the ancient Near East. So these are treaties between a suzerain or a, a, a big king, you might say an emperor, like the emperor of Assyria or the emperor of Babylon, uh, with, with uh, lesser kings, like the kings of Israel, Judah, Moab, uh, 
um, Edom, those sorts well, of things. So this this treaty is uh, a treaty of loyalty and service and obedience to the emperor from these uh, kind of lesser kings. Um, my my own teacher John Levinson certainly agrees with that insight, and it is a helpful insight to talk about to to compare the uh, you know compare the Sinai covenant to those ancient Near Eastern treaties. Uh, but he also speaks about covenant as uh, as a an affair of the heart, and I think that's really a lovely way of talking about it. In his book Sinai and Zion, John Levinson talks about. Uh, the the covenant between God and Israel is not just a political covenant, not just a kind of a test of loyalty, uh, but also uh, an affair of the heart that that God loves the people Israel. We read that in several places, including Deuteronomy seven, and that in turn the people are to love God, uh, and that's I think uh, at least for me a more helpful way uh, of thinking about the the covenants in the Old Testament. I would say one of the ways in which, uh, so I live in, Min used to live in Minneapolis and recently moved, one of the ways in which this has come into our everyday discourse is the uh, concern in many cities now with housing covenants and the way that these are binding agreements as to what can and cannot be done with a house. And again, they're not primarily um, agreements like agreeing to contracts to sell a house or things like that. There, there's very interesting keeping a house in, uh, not in a housing development or the more troublesome ones being the ones that restrict to whom you can sell a house. But again, I, I really appreciate that idea that it's not that there's something primarily contractual about it so much as there's intentions to it and assurances and promises associated with it. Uh, in the terms of housing covenants, sometimes quite negative. But uh, again, that's kind of the flip side of this uh, affair of the heart. Looking ahead, Christopher, um, to Matthew. Um, Matthew, it's interesting to me, and maybe this will come into place in the fall. Matthew is the only one who really connects the new covenant, the making of it, and the Lord's Supper with forgiveness. Um, I'm just throwing that out there to see if that resonates at all with you or like, yep, he does. Mm -hmm. So we have this really interesting thing because this idea of covenant as it pertains to the Lord's Supper uh, has a fascinating reception history. So the way in which it has been interpreted and taken up and the it comes up in the the different gospel writers in slightly different fashions and the interesting thing is that matthew is also the author gospel author who spends the most time thinking about the mosaic covenant mm -hmm. and what it means for jesus to come and uh, in matthew's words fulfill the mosaic covenant which is an interesting thing to think about in terms of this idea of promises that is, that Jesus is the one who comes to finally uh, make it complete, could be a way that we say. And so it's perhaps uh, somewhat unsurprising that that train continues through Matthew's take on the Lord's Supper and the way in which this covenant is, or the Lord's Supper becomes seen through that covenant language. Whereas, you know, we see in, in Paul, and then especially in the letter to the Hebrews, it gets interpreted more in terms of this idea of testament the idea that this is more more of a kind of last will and promise than it is um, a covenant in the sense of uh, what we see in the the old testament so i think it is an interesting link between what matthew is trying to tell us about jesus and the old testament the, all right well go ahead Catherine. Oh, I was just going to say another important thing to note about the covenants uh, in in the Old Testament are that they always are initiated by God, right? Mm -hmm. And and people don't people don't initiate covenants with uh, with God. God initiates the covenant, and it, and it comes from God's side, so to speak, right? God is the one who who, who makes the promises. Um, and then the law becomes, and we can talk about this later when we get to the specific text, like particularly uh, Exodus 19 and 20, where we have the uh, Ten Commandments. The law becomes the means by which the people live out their part of the relationship, 
right? The, the, the initial act of making that covenant of establishing that relationship comes from God. Uh, and it's good that it does, right? <laughs> because God is more faithful than, uh, than human beings. Uh, but there is a part that human beings play, and that is to that is to learn to live out this role as God's people. Um, so that's all I uh, was going to say. Ralph, you were you were going to jump in. I was just going to say a brief word about that. Then this, if people follow this, that six week uh, first sort of mini series, it it culminates in the renewing of the covenant which um, at the end of the book of um, Joshua, actually there are several times within the book of Joshua that the covenant is renewed, not just at the end, but the, at the end is a big one. Um, and um, the need, there is the need for intentional renewing of the covenant from generation to generation and from uh, even from sort of time to season to season within human lives themselves. So I just thought I was going to mention that, but we will uh, talk much more about that when we get to that. So then uh, we're suggesting a second sermon series uh, that would go from October 23rd through Christ the King Sunday on uh, the covenant people are living out the covenant. And so you first of all get this uh, um it's a story that some uh, in ancient Israel found so embarrassing that when the chronicle, uh, it's in Kings, right? It's the David and Bathsheba and Uriah, then with the prophet Nathan's story, really get four character, main characters in it, um, in which um, David uh, exploits Bathsheba and then has her husband killed to cover it up. Uh, and then Nathan confronts him. This story was so embarrassing that the Chronicle, uh, Chronicles leaves it out uh, totally. Um, so clearly there's a point it's telling the truth about human nature um, that, uh, Catherine, you make the point that uh, the flood, one of the things that the flood teaches is that uh, human nature doesn't change. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, the human... Uh, the text says in Genesis, uh, you know, Genesis six, and then again, I believe in Genesis eight, before and after the flood, the the inclination of the human heart is only evil continually. So the flood doesn't change that, uh, and neither does the covenant in the sense of uh, the the kind of inclinations of the human heart, and yet. Uh, and and so we see, of course, David, this golden king of Israel, uh, committing this heinous act. And yet, because uh, of the covenant, because of God's faithfulness, not because of human beings' faithfulness, but because of God's faithfulness, uh, David is given another chance. He's given the chance to repent, which he does. Uh, and uh, he's not uh, he's he's punished, but not excluded from the covenant. Um, so yeah, the the being in covenant doesn't imply you know perfection of the human heart uh though i think it we can talk about a, a kind of transformation of the human heart gradually uh over time certainly the new testament talks about that um and uh even more so uh the covenant speaks of god's faithfulness even to sinful flawed human beings and david is nothing if not flawed <laughs> No, and I think Nathan's parable, so he tells a parable about a man with his little lamb that he very much loves, and it's a, it's one of the first parables we get, and one of the few parables in the Old Testament. Uh, but one of the things I think is interesting is as we think about this idea of covenants and relationships, is the way in which David, as a king, has expectations of him that he will be generous and he will be caring just as God has been generous and caring to him. And David falls very short of this, as we say. And Nathan's parable plays on this, this idea that uh, those who are have a lot of responsibility ought to uh, use that responsibility well, use that responsibility and power well. And I think there's a, there's a way in which that speaks to what you were saying, Catherine, about the differences between a covenant and a political treaty in the way in which a political tree often involves the ability of the stronger party to exploit the lesser party 
Mm. Whereas the Nathan in this parable really kind of tenderly illustrates the way that it should be precisely the opposite, that those who are stronger should actually care even more for those who are weak. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, Christopher. As we go on in that series, then of course you get Solomon uh, who uh, prays for wisdom uh, and uh, then exhibits that wisdom. Uh, he is uh, living out the covenant perhaps in a different way than his father David, but uh, in in a in a faithful way. We get a light the story of Elisha healing Naaman, uh, the Syrian general, which is a uh, a lovely story to expand on because you know, sometimes people have a problem with the covenant as being, you know, God playing favorites, right? That we, we talk, we'll talk about this later when we get to Abraham, but this kind of scandal of election. And here we see, um, as we see earlier in the story of Joseph, but here we see also uh, with Elisha's healing of Naaman that, that the, the, the blessing of Israel does not exclude the nations, that in fact, the blessing of Israel is meant to be, uh, you know, that Israel is meant to be a conduit of blessing uh, to the nations. Uh, Abraham is told, uh, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we see that in, in the story, again, of Joseph, but also in the story of Elisha healing Naaman. Um, so again, uh, people living out the covenant, uh, the, the covenant people. Uh, then we get into the prophets, uh, starting in November 13th, we have Micah, uh, who is promising a ruler from Bethlehem, and again, uh, can, obviously hearkening back to the story of David and looking forward, uh, Christians believe, to Jesus. Uh, and, and that ruler is one, as you were saying, Christopher, that uh, does not lord it over others, but instead mm -hmm. serves others, desires justice, kindness, uh, and walking humbly with God. Uh, we see the same emphasis on peace in the next uh, piece uh, in Isaiah 36, uh, where Assyria, this powerful nation, is threatening Jerusalem. Uh, and Isaiah uh, says God will save the city. Again, God will be faithful to God's covenant, and nations will beat swords into plowshares. So this is, again, uh, you're welcome to, to subdivide the readings as you would like, but this is one way that you might think about it. First talking about covenant and then talking about uh, living out the covenant. And then we get into Advent, uh, which we'll, we'll end this podcast with that because uh, we'll do another podcast to introduce the Christmas and, uh, and the, the spring, winter and spring readings. But what do we want to say about the, the text chosen for Advent? Or the, is there a common theme that we can talk about here? Well, I think there is a common theme. I mean, just, just to point out that we, in the fourth Sunday of Advent is when we get to Matthew, and then we do have all these fulfillment passages that Christopher mentioned, and the connection of, um, you know, Jesus um, being born in a way that fulfills part of Isaiah that we don't actually read this fall. But that's well known. But I think that I think that that a connection here is um, that we the idea that um, we live out our faith in a particular time. That Habakkuk especially ends with um, this uh, radical vision for the the way a righteous person lives, giving thanks in the the midst of scarcity. Esther, of course. Um, it, um, is called into her vocation for a particular time. Uh, and then in the third week, um, set in the exile, the entire people are called to be a covenant people to the rest of the earth, which really harkens all the way back then to Abraham and then leads well into Jesus. Well, so that's uh, that's our, our uh, podcast overview for year one, uh, the year of Matthew. Uh, and again, welcome, Christopher, and we'll look forward to having you again with us uh, later in the fall. It was great to be here. Thank you. 